back, I was in uh, Michigan preaching, and uh, it was during the ordination service of, of the the pastor of the church, and uh, the old, old one of one of our mutual friend of ours was singing. And if, for those of you guys that are that are probably thirty and older, you'll remember the show Star Search. Remember that show? Was that Ed McMahon? On Star Search. Anyhow, she uh, went through that show and took second place, the lady singing. So she has this incredible voice. And her husband's sitting beside me, and he's singing, and he has this incredible voice. And we're in worship, and she's, she's leading this song. And I mean, the presence of the Lord is here like it was, was there like it was here this morning. And I'm just sitting there singing, and I'm hearing him, and I'm hearing her. And I'm thinking to myself, they sound so good, but who? There, there was this idiot singing really off key. And it was driving me nuts. No offense if you sing bad. But I was like, oh, my gosh, who is this guy that's singing so loud and so off key? It's driving me nuts. Then I realized it was me. <laughs> my bad. Why you guys go ahead? The, Lord, Lord, the, the Bible says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Not necessarily the congregation, amen. <laughs> amen. We do give God our best, though. That's right, babe. Hey, a few little things, guys. Um, next Saturday, we're going to Paintball Ridge. Is that right, Charles? Charles, can you stand up and wave at everybody? He loves it when I do this to him. Uh, he's got a sign-up list. If you want to go to that, please see him after service and write your name and number down. We're going to meet here at the church at 1 o'clock. If you want to ride, or you can go up there on your own, but we're going to leave here about 1 o'clock. And we are going to go shoot each other with guns. Um, that sounds like a party. <laughs> Anybody? Some of you guys like it. Uh, also, guys, um, movie at the park last night, if you didn't get to go, it was just absolutely, it was awesome. Let's get a round of applause for them. It was awesome. Joe and, and, and April, you guys did an amazing job. Uh, yes, it was just incredible. Uh, also, uh, Connor Brown, where you at, buddy? Happy birthday, man. It's his birthday today. Yeah. Big Sweet 16. And then lastly, guys, before I start preaching, I wanna, just want to honor, honor some people that are here. Ferd and Jay Seen, they're getting ready to take off into the mission field. Uh, evangelism, let's just uh, stretch your hands that way. And just, Lord, I just pray you bless them and all they do, Father God. God, I pray you go before them and make a way, Father. I pray that, Lord, everything they touch, God, that you would just uh, bless, Father. Lord, uh, I, I say, God, that the Abrahamic covering where the sole of their feet treads, that it would be theirs. God, I thank you for it. I pray you bless them. Let them see salvations and signs and wonders. In Jesus' name, amen. And uh, Pastor Tim Scott's in the house. Pastor, how are you? Stand up and say hi to everybody, man. Some of you guys don't know him. This is the man. Anything you want to say, Pastor? He's awesome, man. He, uh... Absolutely wonderful guy. All right, turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 10. And I'll do the same. (coughs) Excuse me, sorry about that. Exodus chapter 10. All right, we're going to read verses 21 through 23. All right, so what's going on here, guys? This is during the plagues. Moses is trying to free the people, and um, we're, we're, um, the, the plagues, several plagues have came, and there's two yet to go. One is uh, darkness, and then the last was the uh, angel of death. So verse 21, here's what it says. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky, and there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even a darkness which may be felt. Anybody ever been there where it was so dark you could feel it? No, but, well, I've been there where it was so dark that it just was about captivating. It was just about uh, crippling or, or, cripp- or, or paralyzing. It was, it was, it was terrifying. I, I've been in that situation where it is just, it's so dark you can absolutely feel it. And this is what was going on in the land. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. So not, not just like overnight, but for three days. Anybody ever been, been like in a cave and the flashlight goes out? And all of a sudden, you know every bear and lion in Cedar County, which isn't very many. They're in that cave with you. Yeah. 
You know what I mean? Uh, th- th- that's that's kind of how it was. It was so dark. But listen, it was so dark. But the scary thing about this for the people, they had no idea how long it was going to last. We're reading it from 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 a, um, when it, when it's already finished perspective. But they're living it. So all of a sudden, the, the sun's blotted out, and they can't see the hand in front of their face. It's so dark. That it, they, again, the darkness you could feel, and they have no idea that how long it's going to last. And, and, and we read here, it lasts three days. Now, this is where I want to get to. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. Let's talk about that. Now, again, it's not just dark, but it's so dark that it's terrifying, right? It's paralyzing. It's crippling. You, you, you don't know how long it's going to last. And it's so dark, guys. That nobody moves a muscle. You didn't, no one moved from his place, so that meant there was no potty breaks. That meant that there was no, I'm hungry, let's go find some food. That meant I'm thirsty, but we're not going to drink. Because they did not move from where they stood. Now that is absolutely insane, but only, uh, only God, right? But here's, what the, here's the verse that I love, the second half of that. It says, but all the sons of Israel had light. In their dwelling. So let me simply ask you a question. Is there a light in your dwelling? Is there a light in your dwelling? In in your life, is there a light in your life? When all the rest of the world may be getting darker and darker and darker and darker. Is your life, is your house a place of light? Is, is, Is literally, is your home a place that light can dwell? Is there a light in your dwelling? And of course, darkness and light don't get along. So I'm gonna talk to you guys for just a few moments of time. Um, two things. One, literally how to have light in your home. And two, how to have light in your life, okay? So let's go into this. Again, ask yourself, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, there we go. Is there light in your dwelling? There you go. My wife loves it when I do that because she absolutely hates that. She hates it when preachers do that. (laughs) You're welcome, babe. She's kind of a fuddy-duddy, you know? (laughs) She said that, not me. She said that, not me. I think she's Beautiful. (laughs) I try to make her do goofy stuff all the time, and she's way too cool. (laughs) I'm not. (laughs) Okay, Uh, a few ways you can have light in your house. Uh, Luke 11.33, will you put that up there? Um, First of all, you got to make the light a priority. Put Luke 11.33 up there. It says, no one, after lighting a lamp, puts it away in a cellar or under a basket, but they put it on a lamp lamp stand so that that those who enter may see the light. Now, obviously, we talk about that, and that it makes perfect sense. Nobody lights a lamp in their home and then hides it, right? So if I were to say that to you, like we sing this little light of mine, I'm not going to sing it. We talked about that, me and my off-key ability. Uh, I'm not going to sing it, but you know that song, This Little Light of Mine, and I'm not going to hide it under a bushel. I'm not going to let Satan blow it out. And I realize that and as, as, as a Christian body, the, 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 the church culture would agree with that. We'd say, well, I'm not going to hide my light. Now, here's the reality. Most of us are hiding our light, not because we're afraid to share, but because we're covering it with other stuff. See, it's not, it's not necessarily the fact that we're going, well, I don't want them to know I'm a Christian, and I don't want them to know that I follow Jesus because they may not like me. There's some of that, but I really don't think that's the problem in the church today. I think the problem in the church today is our job is more important than the light. I think the problem in the church today that our family is more important than the light, and someone that they don't like when I say that stuff, but the reality is I cannot be the husband that God has created me to be unless if I'm the priest or the man of God that he has created me to be. The only way to be the man of God is to take care of the light. See, this is the reality. It's not my opinion. This is simply what the Word teaches. If you don't like it, take it up with him. He wrote it, not me. Most of us... It's not that we're afraid of of people knowing we're Christians. We just put everything else in front of the light. We put our job. We put our hobbies. We put everything else in life. And and we don't mean to do it. I I think that's the reality. For most of us, it's not on purpose. But that's the problem. The problem is, I told the class last Sunday night, the school of ministry, the problem for most Christ followers is we live our Christian life on accident. And until you begin to live on purpose, you'll constantly have other stuff covering the light. If I were to light a candle and I were to put the lid on it, it would stay lit for a moment of time. But what would happen to it? Why would it go out? It would suffocate. There's no oxygen. Here's the thing. God put a fire in you. Your job's to bring the oxygen. 
Your job, your job is to fuel that fire so there may be a light in your dwelling. Your job is to, be a, is to fuel, begin to do things in your house, begin to do things with your husband, with your wife, with your kids, to fuel the fire. In Timothy, it says this. It says, fan into flames the gift of God with the laying on of my hands. Fan it into flames. He says, it's just a flicker. Your job, though, is to begin to fan that thing and blow on that thing until pretty soon it's a raging fire. But again, for most of us, we put stuff in front. And we put something in front. Listen, husbands and wives, if you have kids in this house, I, I, if you hear nothing else I say, you need to hear this. You need to make the light the priority. If not for you, do it for your kids. I can't tell you how often I deal, and not just here, but in, in the last 10 years of ministry with, with, with parents that are broken because their kids are far away from God, and they'll come back to me and they'll say, I wish when they were younger. I would have made it a priority. I was talking to a guy. He may get to watch this. If he watches it, how you doing? We were talking yesterday, at a, uh, Friday night at a wedding. We were talking about church, and, and the, it was in Sedan. He's like, well, I'm going to come to your church sometime. I said, man, I'd love for you to come, but listen, you need to find a local church body. I, I'd love for you to come see me, but I really can't fulfill what you need. You need to find a local church body and be plugged in. You've got to have the light in your house. And he said, I know, but I work so much, and, you know, Sunday's my day off, and he goes through all the reasons. And listen, I don't know the guy, so I have no real ties to him. You know what I mean? I'm not afraid of ticking him off. Not that I'm real afraid of ticking anybody off. I said, bro, that's all good, but listen, you can have all the excuses in the world, but the bottom line is if you don't make it a habit, you'll never do it, and your kids need it. (sighs) I know it. My kids need it. I said, the reality is you're going to have a thousand excuses. Why not? So begin to make a priority of making the light, making sure your home is a place the light can dwell. If we're not on purpose, we will accidentally cover the light with lots of other stuff. We must make Jesus a priority for our kids instead of an afterthought. Listen, my daughter last Wednesday, I wasn't wasn't able to be here last Wednesday. Um, My my pastor in Joplin, his father-in-law died. And so we went up to see them. And uh, we're going to take our kids, and they have daughters that are Chloe's age. And um, we told Chloe, Chloe, we're going to go to Joplin. And she was like, no, it's keeper's night. I was like, awesome. But no, we have to go. (laughs) She's like, but dad, I want to go to church. I want to go to keeper's. And you know, in that moment, I had to explain to her that that's, that's what we do. But right now, we have friends that are hurting, and we have to go, we're going to go see them and go to church with them. But it was so awesome, because my daughter understood at seven years old, not quite eight, that church is what we do. Right? That's so why I told my, my, my new friend, I told him, I said, you go, not because it's convenient, not because, but you go because it's Sunday. You've got to get to a point that it's what you do. There's no question. And my daughter at seven years old went, hey. It's keeper's night, and that's where I want to be. And I was like, yes, <laughs> I was so proud. But the reality is, if we're not making it a priority, it'll get left behind, and the light will get covered up, and it will suffocate. The second thing, we, thing we're doing, we see this in 2 Samuel 3. I preached a sermon about two years ago called um, Camp by the Lamp, and, I, and it, it's just one of my favorites. But the story in 2 Samuel goes like this. It says, the lamp of God had not yet gone out, right? So every day they would light the lamp, and, and it would be by the ark, and the presence of God would, it would light this fire, and, 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 and it would stay all day, and eventually the fire would go out. But it says, the lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Eli goes to his usual place of bed. Eli didn't see very well, and so he stumbled into his normal, I love the word, usual place, the the place he always goes to find rest. The problem is where he went to find rest wasn't near the fire. Come on, somebody. The problem is where he went to find rest every night wasn't near the lamp of God. It wasn't where God was. It was just a place he became became his, his ritual or his habit of going to bed. But Samuel, the Bible says in 2 Samuel Three. But Samuel went and he laid by the ark of God. So see, Eli went to his usual place where it was comfortable, where it was easy. And at this point, Eli's heart was far from God, but not Samuel. Samuel understood the importance of having a fire inside the house. Samuel understood the importance of making sure his house was lit up for for God in this case. So he went and he just laid by the ark of God. Now this is a young man. Guys, you got to understand me. He wasn't a priest yet. He didn't have the right to be necessarily in the presence yet but here's what i love about god he will never deny himself to you he will never deny his presence from you ever not my opinion that's the word he says come to me all you who are weary and i'll give you rest samuel understood 
I can easily go through my routine and go to my usual place. Or I can go near the lamp. I can go near the lamp of God where the presence falls. I can go when I'm tired and I'm exhausted and I'm weary and I'm, and I'm hurting on the inside. I can go near the fire. Here's the reality. If we will purpose in our hearts to be by the fire, if we will purpose in our hearts to get around the presence of God, if we will purpose in our hearts to make him number one, to make him the priority, and regardless of what's comfortable and convenient, regardless of what's easy, if we'll purpose in our hearts to get near him, your lamp will stay lit. If it's a common practice, I like to talk about this, he was communing or communicating with God. If it becomes a common practice in your life, Cody, to talk to the Father, I'm telling you, your lamp will always stay lit. I hear people say, well, I'm just, I'm worn out and I'm dried out. Well, join the club. Join the club. We all get there. Anybody? Yeah. But here's the good news. Get near the fire and you'll catch you. If you're dry, you're easily lit. (laughs) Come on. That was good. There we go. There we go. Yeah. There you go. I'm proud of you. (laughs) That's the reality, though. When we're dry, it's easier to catch fire. And I've seen that in my life. Most of the times when I'm the driest, now there's dry seasons. We've talked about that, guys. Uh, The desert is not punishment. The desert is the beginning of promotion. So if you're in a dry place or the desert, can I tell you where to get? Get near the fire. Get near the fire. Get near the light. See, if we're making it a habit to communicate, the problem for most of us, here's what we say. Well, I don't really hear God's voice. Moses, um, he tells the people, he comes down, he says, hey, guys, I got some awesome news. You ready? Yeah, okay, some of you guys are ready. The rest of you guys, I don't know. He says, I got some incredible news for you. Guess what? God wants to speak to us all. And guess what the people said? They were like, yeah. No, that's not what they said. What did they say? They were like, no, you go, Moses. It's a lot easier for me to just play my game and go through the routine. And you go up to the mountain. You go hear from God and tell us what he says. And that breaks my heart because most of the American church today, this is the case you want the the, the pastor or the TV evangelist to hear from God for your situation. Here's the reality. Camp by the lamp. Get in his presence. He wants to talk to you. I remember the first few times God spoke to my heart. I still remember them. I was... Golly, six, seven, eight years old. I didn't have a special connection. I just was by the lamp. You see what I'm saying? See, for most of us, we, we feel like we, that God doesn't want to talk to us. I can tell you, it's his heart's desire to, to, to have intimacy with you, to communicate clearly with you. The problem is we have to position ourselves. The problem is most of us, our house is dark. For most of us, our house doesn't have a light. So whose fault is it? Then we blame it on God. Well, he doesn't talk to me. Most of the time when he's not talking to me, I can tell you whose fault it is. It's mine. Because he longs. One time I was praying, and, and he said something. And I got up, and I was like, I've heard from God. And I started to walk off, and God was like, uh, I'm not done. <laughs> Some of y'all have done that to your wife. <laughs> You know what I mean. You're like, okay, babe. And she's like, nah, no, get back in here. We got to talk. We got to talk. For me, it's when I got to go pick stuff up at the store. Uh, she says, hey, will you pick up a few things? And there's always a few things that most of the guys know what I mean. We don't really want to pick up. Some of you'll get it later. Anyhow, it's, we, we, we forget it, you know, conveniently. We just forget it, and it's because we didn't really hear the whole conversation. My dad never does that. He hears everything my mom says. <laughs> Just kidding, Dad. You're awesome. Um, <laughs> so anyhow, bring it back in, guys. So anyhow, for most of us, this is God. I get up, and I'm like, I've heard from God. And God was like, Bo, I'm not done. And then he went on to tell me, he said, the problem is you're, here, you're wanting to hear a word, and I'm wanting to tell you a, a, a story. And you're only hearing the first sentence thinking, yes, and God's going, no, I'm not done yet. See, for most of us, if we'll, if we'll position ourselves to camp by the lamp, our house will always stay lit. It may be dark everywhere, but your house will stay lit. Finally, the bread, reading the Bible, getting in the Word. Most of us hear what we'll say. Well, Pastor, I just, I work so many hours, and I'm so busy, I don't have time to read my Bible. Anybody? Yeah, you don't have to, you don't have to raise, yeah, a few of us are, are bold enough. My hand's up. Because life's insane. 
Guess what? It's got to be priority. Here's what 1 Samuel 21 says. 1 Samuel 21, 6, David eats the showbread, but here's what it says. I love it. It says that the priest gave Daniel the bread because they would replace the bread, the bread of the presence, daily hot before the Lord. Now, someone says, what does that mean? Here's what it means. The priest would get up early in the morning. They would get up. Now, listen, we all think like, well, he's the priest. I bet. Here's what most people think. Well, that's the pastor. I bet Bo gets up every morning in a good mood. No one makes him mad. And he prays for 14 hours. And then he fasts the rest of the day. None of that's true. <laughs> Wish it was. I quit half the Mondays, you know <laughs> <laughs> but here's the reality. The priests, they would get up in the morning. And I'm sure their stomach hurt just like your stomach hurt. I'm sure they were exhausted from people whining just like you're exhausted from your coworkers whining. I'm sure, I'm sure they were tired because they didn't get enough sleep just like you're tired when you don't get enough sleep. But they would get up in the morning and they would begin to labor to make the bread. They would knead the bread. They would pound. They would do every piece of the process to make the bread before they did anything else that day. They would make the bread. They would cook the bread. And they would place it hot before the Lord every morning. For most of us, we cool off because we don't intentionally get up and make ourselves hot before the Lord every morning. For most of us, we get up and we're, we're running late. And I thought about this. I thought, well, the priest probably never woke up late. Hogwash. I bet they woke up late all the time. They didn't have alarm clocks. <laughs> Doesn't help me really that much. <laughs> Snooze button. Here's the reality. I guarantee you they woke up late. I'm sure sometimes the, the, the Levitical priest, he woke up. He was like, oh my gosh, I'm late. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we are. And he begins and he runs. But before he can do anything else, he's got one priority in his life. To get the bread ready. To get the bread ready. Because if the bread's not ready, nothing else in the day matters. I can tell you this. The days that I get the bread ready, the days that I get the bread in my life, guess what? Those days are awesome. The days that I don't have time, guess what? They're terrible. They're terrible. I used to get up at 2 to go to work. That's, that's of the devil. <laughs> but guess what? Get the bread ready. Take time in your day. And someone says, but pastor, I don't understand it. Join the club. One time I sat down to read. I wasn't a pastor yet. I was like, God, I want you to show me something. I wasn't in a daily reading. I wasn't in a devotional. I was like, God, I want you to show me something. So I opened the Bible and I read some stuff and guess what happened? He showed me some stuff. Because he loves me. See, if we'll purpose in our heart, the Bible says the word does not come back void. So if we'll purpose in our heart to get that bread hot every morning and to place ourselves before him hot every morning, can I tell you what will happen? It won't return void. All of a sudden you're going, you'll be be doing something and and, and someone will tick you off at work and your first thought is, I'm going to punch him right in the face. And then you remember, a soft answer turns away wrath. You're like, where did that come from? (laughs) It's because you're putting it in you. See, the more we bake the bread, the hotter we become. The hotter we become, the brighter our light shines. Men, I need to talk to the men for a second. I'm not a lady, so I'm talking to the men. If you're a man, raise your hand. There we go. (laughs) Here's what the Bible says about you, men. The Bible says you're the priest of the home. So I got some good news for you. You have the opportunity to lead your family. You're blessed enough for God to have called to say, Joe, lead your family. Eric, lead your family. Kirk, Trey, lead your family. You're blessed enough. Mitch, you're blessed enough for God to have called you and said, okay, your job is to make sure your family's hot before me every morning. Your job is to make sure your family is getting the bread ready. Come on, somebody. Your job is to make sure that, that everything's in order so that there's a lamp lit in your house. Now, ladies, listen to me. Guess what? If your husband's not doing it, don't hate him. Help him. If he's not doing it, don't nag at him. Lead the way. Show him. Get in the word by yourself. Encourage him to come sit down by you. The problem is most of us, we get upset and we're like, well, bless God, pastor. He's not being the man of the home. And I'm like, man, I don't want to hear that. I've told some of y'all that. I don't want to hear that. He don't want to hear that. You love him. You support him. And you help him lead. 
You do it. Wives, listen to me. Your kids, they're your babies. Nothing's more important in your life than that. Any ladies? Make sure they're hot daily. Truth is, parents, we have a huge responsibility in training our children out. We have a huge responsibility in making sure that they're ready. My little boy, he's six. He's begging to get baptized. Jace is. And we're going to do that coming up. Not today, though, right? Yeah, we're still talking about it, what it means and all that. But nothing makes me prouder than when, when, when my kids have given their heart to the Lord. And I love, it when he, I love it when he hits home runs. Today, he shot with his 22 the, uh, um, the, the, the front light out of my lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> I was proud. <laughs> it was the old lawnmower. We were shooting together. It was the old lawnmower. But I was like, way to go, dude. That was a great shot. It was on purpose. <laughs> I was proud. <laughs> yeah, I was like, hey. But here's my point. Nothing makes me prouder. Then when he'll go, Dad, can we do a devotion? I'm like, oh my gosh, yes. Because my job is to place him hot before the Lord. Yes. There's a lot of areas, and I'm kind of spending some time here, and I don't know why. It's just on my heart. There's a lot of areas as a dad and as a pastor I fail. I'm not always the best. But if there's one area I want to succeed, it's this area. He may, he may leave the house, Jason, Chloe, and brother, they may leave the house and go, wow, I really wish my dad would have made a lot more money. <laughs> Me too, kid. <laughs> but one thing they're going to know leaving the house, one thing they're going to know is who their real daddy is. One thing they're going to know, my daughter is about four. I know we're not shouting today, but we've got to have this stuff. I'm thankful for the shout, but we have to have this stuff to help us live our life. My daughter was probably four years old. We were talking about, she's been my princess since she was born. All the guys with little girls know what I mean. She's been my princess since she was born. And I, was, I would call her my princess. Yeah, yeah, I love you so much. You're my princess. And you're my princess. And you're my princess. And all this. And she said, and, and mom's the queen. I said, that's right, baby. Mama is the queen. And then she said, um, and, and you're the king. And I said, that's right, baby. I'm the king. She goes, but Jesus is the real king. That's right, baby. Jesus is the real king. I'm telling these stories. Why? Because I want you to know the most important thing as a a parent in our life is making sure our kids are ready. That when they leave the house, the Bible says train a child up in the way they should go. And when they're old, they won't depart far from it. The most important thing we can do is train them up. The most important thing we can do is train them up. Secondly, guys, listen, mom, dad, Maybe you don't have a dad in the home. Be the priest. And then have men with godly influence around. Secondly, guys, the light in your life. First Thessalonians 5, 4 through 8 basically says this. It says, you don't have to put that one up there. It says, we're not among those that fall asleep. And I, it's, we're not among those that slumber. And I love that. Can I tell you why? Because how many of you guys have known people that slept on the job? Yeah. How many of you guys have slept on the job? A few of us. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, but the reality is, guys, most people, even though if they're not sleeping on the job, most people today sleep on the job. My daughter last night, I tell a lot of stories about my kids because they're awesome. Last night, my daughter, Chloe, I was like, now you've got to clean the room, clean the living room because you messed it up. And she's like, well, how good do I have to clean it? I said, I want you to do your best. She goes, okay, do I need to clean the hall? I said, Chloe, do your best. Listen, I never realized how good advice that was. That jacked her up. I'm serious, didn't it? She was like, okay, but do I have to clean the foyer? I said, Chloe, do your best. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> I kid you not. Didn't she? she must have to cry. It was so cute. I was like, honey, do your best. I know what my best is, but where do I have to do my best? <laughs> it was awesome. Do I have to do my best before you? I'm like, Chloe, just do your best. And she did awesome, and she did it so joyfully. She even cleaned, like, everything. It was awesome. You know what I mean? But the beauty in that was, guess what? It wasn't me going, blah, you do. It was, baby, do your best. See, that's how God is with us. He's just simply saying, do your best. Don't sleep on the job. When it's time to go to bed, go to bed. But right now, when, when Jesus said like this, didn't you know I'd be, my, be about my father's business? Right now, in our society, in our life, in a world that's dying apart from Jesus Christ, can I tell you what our job is? Do your best. Not halfway, not the bare minimum. Do your best. Do your best. 
We're not among those that slumber. We're among those that do our best. I was talking to my neighbor, a uh, super good guy, and uh, he was talking about high school. He did, he's not from here, and he said, I heard you were an athlete. I said, well, man, here's the thing. I wasn't, uh, my ability wasn't always that, but my, my heart was. I had a lot more heart than ability. So we're talking a little bit more, and he says, he said, well, how many hours do you week, do you, do you, a week do you work at church? I said, here's the thing, man. My, my heart's a lot bigger than my ability. <laughs> my point was this. There's a lot of things I'm not good at, but I'm going to give it my all. See, as, as Christ fathers, there's going to be areas you fall. There's going to be times that you, you're going to be mad at yourself and you're going to struggle, but guess what? Do your best. Don't, don't, don't be satisfied with just a, a menial effort. Do your best. 1 John 1 7. Will you put that one up there? 1 John 1 7. Talks about walking in the light, and I love it. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. But it says, but if we, let's try it again. But if we, but if we walk in the light, I love the word walk because it's active. He's saying, listen, if you're active about being in the light, if you're on purpose, intentional about being in the light. See, walk is a verb. Walk, I, I don't, I was talking, who was I talking with earlier about walking? So, oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> about you guys walk from your house. How far you guys live away from here? Quarter mile. They live a quarter mile and they walk to church. I was like, that's so awesome. And, and Bree was like, no, it's not. <laughs> I was like, you're right. No, it's not. And, and we were talking about walking. I said, you know, and my rule in life is this. If I have to walk more than 20 yards, I'm getting in the car and I'm driving. And if I'm running, I'm catching a ball or I'm being chased by a bear. And then I ain't trying to outrun a bear. I'm just trying to outrun you. Y'all know what I mean. So here's the reality. But the thing is, when I get up, if people, my wife's like, let's go on a walk. And I'm like, I'm like, Chloe, what? My best. <laughs> but he's saying, listen, if we walk. He said, it, basically, the Bo James version, BJV. If your lifestyle, if you're actively pursuing the light. We have fellowship with one another and in him. I love it. Because for most of us, we don't walk. We fall, we trip, we sleep, but we don't walk in the light. Galatians 5.16 says, walk in the spirit so that you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. I love it again, walk in the spirit. He's saying on purpose, actively quit living your life as a Christ follower accidentally and start to live on purpose. Start to live on purpose and have some purpose inside of you and realize that God wants to do something amazing in you. Come on, somebody. He says, Galatians 5, 16, walk in the Spirit so that you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you have a struggle in your life, if you struggle with um, anger or malice or, or, or drunkenness or, or sexual impurity or anger or the Bible says disobeying your parents, if you struggle with any parents, black like, glory, listen, son, anybody? A few of you guys. If you have struggles in your life, can I tell you what to do? Be intentional about walking in the Spirit. On purpose, walk in the Spirit. Well, someone says, well, Pastor Bo, what does that mean to walk in the Spirit? I can tell you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. He says, listen, people are going to cut you off on the road. You're going to want to react in a negative way. But walk in peace. Uh, you, you're going to get, get in trouble by your boss. You're going to, you, listen, husbands, maybe this isn't everybody, but listen, um, your, your wife is going to be late for something. Walk in patience. Why? Your husband's going to want to buy a new gun. Walk in, in acceptance. <laughs> Sorry. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, have a good day. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Here's the reality. The, the reality is the fruit of the Spirit is something that we have to intentionally put on. It's not something that comes natural. It has to be intentional. I tell you guys all the time, there's people that I want to just punch right in the throat. I tell you guys all the time. And I, and I tell you that because I want you to know I'm very human, and I get mad at people too. But I have to walk in the Spirit. And there's people that want to punch me right in the face. And I hope they're walking in the Spirit. <laughs> See, if we intentionally walk in love, we won't fall into hate. 
If we're intentionally walking in joy, we won't fall into sorrow. If we're intentionally walking in self-control, we won't fall out of it. See, it's an on-purpose thing. We're, we're talking about keeping your houses alit. In Numbers 9, 15 through 23, you don't have to put that up there either. Here's what we see. We see uh, the children of Israel, right? They're, they're, they're wandering in the wilderness. But how do they know where to go? Well, there would be a fire by day, or a, a fire by night and a cloud by day. And when the fire would settle, they would set up shop. However many, 600,000 to a few million tents would set up. So we're not talking like a church. We're talking like a big city full of people would set their tents up. And if, the, if it lasted a year, they'd stay a year. If it lasted a month, they'd stay a month. Here's what the Bible says. If it lasted from morning till evening and, it ra- and the Lord pulled up the fire, pulled up the cloud, they would pack up and they would move to the next spot. Well, that's dedication. But here's what they understood. To be who God wants me to be, to have what God wants me to have, to, 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 to have, who, have who God wants me to have, I have to obey the Spirit. I have to follow His leading. Someone says, but Pastor Bo, how do I follow His leading in my life? It's real simple. You ready for this? One, respond by the fruit. Respond by the fruits of the Spirit. Two, go to His Word. I've had people tell me in my life, well, I don't really, I, I don't, I don't, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I'm not saying you do, because being a, being a, going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Not at all. But, I wouldn't say but. Guys, here's the reality. He says, not me, the Bible talks about being faithfulness to the house. Being faithful to the house. See, God won't violate his word. I've had people say, well, you don't really have to pay your tithe. I, listen, whether you do or don't doesn't affect me at all, because I'm blessed because we pay our tithe and we give. But God will not violate his word. He doesn't, you need to hear me, God does not violate his own word. I had a kid, a kid tell me one time, the, he, he wanted to do something that totally was against God's heart. And he said, well, this is what I want to do. And I said, bro, that's, he said, I feel like the Lord told me to do this. I said, bro, I will tell you the Lord did not tell you to do that. Well, how do you know? Because it violates his word. It violates his word. And God will never, he will not make an exception for you. Against his own word, because that would make him a liar, and he cannot lie. That's hard teaching, isn't it? It's hard teaching, but I like it. (laughs) I do, you know, I really do, because here's the reality. That's what made my wife and I who we are. Not following our opinion or our preference, but following the fire. And, And I love you, but if everybody leaves today, and I don't want you to, guess what? We're going to follow the fire. I won't apologize for it. Because guess what? I won't violate his word either. We're in a culture, guys, that struggles with this. We're we're in a very opinionated, offended culture. And Pastor Tim, I know you see it where you're at, where everything offends us and we have an opinion about everything. Guess what? I've told you before, regarding the word, your opinion is invalid if if, if the word says something different. Because his word trumps our opinions every time. And I've had opinions that I looked at the word and was like, whoa, I was wrong. <laughs> my dad's had opinions, and he talked to my mom, and he was like, well, I was wrong. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, Tyler, where you at? <laughs> love you guys. I love you guys. Dad, you're amazing. You're awesome. <laughs> mom, you're so little. Boom. Okay, guys, we're, we're, we're bringing it in. Heidi, will you come on up here? Uh, what's your point, Pastor Bill? It's just been very simple teaching today. Matthew 25 is the story of the ten virgins. They're coming to meet their bride, or their groom. I love this story, guys. Here's what it says. The groom was coming, and the, the ten brides, their heart was to meet the groom. And, and, and they had lamps, and they went out to meet him, and five took oil, and they put oil in, flat, in oil flasks, and they went to meet the groom, and five did not. And the groom, the groom came, and he was like, hey, where, where, where are my ladies at? Right where, where are the brides at? And he finds all five of them, right? He finds five of them that had lamps ready to go, and he found five of them that weren't ready. So he grabbed the five that were, and they rolled out, and they left. 
And the five came knocking and said, will you let us in? And he was like, I don't even know who you are. Can I tell you something? If Man, thank you, Holy Spirit. If your fire isn't lit, he can't recognize you because he can't see you. Because see, you're not known by your righteousness, you're known by his. So without the fire, you have no righteousness. Without the fire, you can't be known by him. The Bible says this, that we are marked with a seal of the Holy Spirit. The oil represents the Holy Spirit. If we don't have enough, we don't have oil, he doesn't know us. That's scary. Someone says, how important is it to have fire in my house? I'll tell you, of 10 people, of 10 that came to meet the groom, of 10 that said, I want to know him, only five made it to heaven. Someone says, pastor, I don't like this. I'm sorry I didn't write it. Of 10 that said, God, I want to make you the Lord of my life. Five of them did something with it, and five of them did nothing. Five of them got to spend eternity in heaven. Five of them were left behind. Half. Jesus is talking here. He's showing us that half of people that are contemplating following him make it. So says, Pastor Bo, it's hard. I, I know. And you know why I know it's hard? Because Pastor Bo has to make sure there's oil in his lamp. I have to make sure that, that my house has got a light in it. Whenever everyone else's house is dark, I can't help that. But all I know is as me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I understand that's scary. I understand that we don't really want to hear that. But here's the reality. What happens when your fire goes out and there's no more oil left. They came, the five came, and they said, can we have some of your oil? And the other five that were ready said, sorry, it's too late. You've missed your moment. You've missed your chance. Five got up that morning and said, I think, it's, I think today's the day. So they got their... their they got their stuff together. They got their flask and they filled it with oil. So th- throughout the day, they could use it. Throughout the day, they would have it as they needed it. Five ran out. Five were ready. Five missed it. Why? Because they didn't purpose to keep their lamps lit. They didn't purpose to keep a fire in their house. They didn't purpose to keep... Because see, here's the reality. If we live accidentally, things will cover the fire or the light. But if we live on purpose, church, when I live on purpose... Listen, I love you guys, but when I live on purpose and you start to cover the light, guess what I have to do? I have to retreat. Now, that's hard for us as a church body. But can I tell you what Jesus did? Jesus had to get away with the Father to keep his lamp lit. Jesus. Listen, if he couldn't do it without getting by the lamp, if he couldn't do it, what makes you think you can? He's raising the dead. He's never done anything wrong. He's healing the sick and opening blind eyes and casting out demons. He's doing all this incredible stuff. But guess what he had to do? Camp by the lamp. He had to refuel his lamp. My opinion, if he didn't, he would have burned out too. But he didn't burn out. Because he knew the importance of keeping his fire lit. We knew the importance of shutting out distractions. I'm guilty. Of turning off the TV, I'm guilty. We knew the importance of just simply getting away with God. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. But I can tell you this. I purpose in my heart to have my lamp lit purpose in our heart at this house at Church on the Hill every other place may be dark, I don't know we purpose in our heart for this place to have a light got a purpose in your heart for you as a person to have a light and for your home to be a home of the light a place where the presence of God can dwell would you close your eyes Dallas, you can go up and go change, brother.
Thank you, Jesus. You come to us. God, I thank you. God, I thank you that despite myself, you're more than enough. God, I thank you that grace is a free gift that we get from you. But our job is to keep oil in the lamp. Our job is to fan the flame. Our job, we have to be active walking in the light, walking in the spirit. We have to be active about doing our part. And I thank you that you're more than enough. I thank you that when I start to get dry or when I start to struggle, you're ready to consume me back up the minute I get next to you. Thank you. Listen, if you're here and you've never asked the Lord in your heart, I got some great news. Now's your moment. If you're here and you feel like your oil's out, I got some great news. Now's your moment. Now's your moment. No one's looking around. But if you need to get your heart right with Jesus Christ, I'm going to count to three. And I just want you to stick your arm up in the air. Here we go. One, two, three. Who's here, man? Yeah, praise God. Who else, guys? Who else is here? Yeah. 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 Thank you, Father God. Who else? I'm just going to wait one second. Yeah. In the very back. Awesome. Who else? Awesome. Yeah, praise God. Who else? Listen, with those, with those hands still up, listen, if you've been, and you've been a little dry lately, you feel like, God, where are you at? And you realize you just need to add a little oil right now. Get your hand up in the air. And where are you at? Yeah, praise God. Praise God. Yes, Father God. Yes, Lord. Yes, God. Yes, God. I'm waiting just one more second. Who else? Yeah, 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 yeah. Here we go. Listen, if you're here and you need to get things right, you need to add a little oil. I'm just going to have you pray this prayer. Listen, when I say with me, it's because I'm praying it too. Father, help me to add some oil. Help me to make you a priority. I give you my life. My hurts, my failures, and I'll trade it for you and your victories and your triumphs. God, today, I'm going to be the the half that adds some oil to my lamp. God, I pray right now over this body right now, Father, I pray your spirit would just rush through the place. God, I pray, God, right now, Lord, as they're weary, as they're exhausted, as they're tired, God, as they're worn out from life, God, I just pray you begin to minister to their hearts right now, Father God. I pray you begin to move inside their lives, God, I thank you for it. God, I pray right now, God, for those that, that have felt like they've been... The, the five of the ten ladies that, that haven't been active. God, I pray that today they would see the importance of being active or walking in the light. God, I pray that men would rise up to be who you've created them to be, the priest of their home. God, that the women would rise up, God, to be who you've created them to be in their house, Father God, to help lead their young ones uh, in the way they should go. God, I pray we would be a people, a city on a hill. <laughs> sought out and not forsaken and I pray that we at church on the hill would be a light in the darkness and the people of this church would be a light in the darkness but I thank you for it in Jesus name we pray Amen